chapter 24, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and they talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up, walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked Jesus, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and all rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. They crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And when some of our companies went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in the scriptures concerning Christ. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going <coughs> further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. And when Jesus was at table with them, Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus. And Jesus disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, gracious and loving God, may the words of our lips meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are our salvation. Amen. More than ever, I'm convinced, looking at 2020, these are serious days we are about to embark upon. Oh, I tell you, we've been through a lot. I have been standing in pulpits for 40 years, the second week in May this year. My earliest memories are of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassinations of the 1960s, the Vietnam War. We've already lived through so much. Yet, I don't think no one has ever faced as serious days as we shall face in the coming year, the coming decade. People have lost the ability to identify 
what is true and what is false. Once upon a time, you had to earn the right to be heard. People had to know your credentials, your track record, your lifestyle. Today, anybody can sit down in front of a computer and spew out internationally uh, whatever they want to write. Blogging, bloggers. Uh, they don't have to defend it. They don't have to sign it. It doesn't have to be so. Vaccinations and drugs and, and uh, uh, childhood diseases. Examples of how we struggle. What's truth? What's a lie? We read, we read, we read, and we read, and the more we read, we're awash in data, awash in information, yet, like never before, we are ever learning and still not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth, the tragedy of our time is that the more data we have and the more information we have only is revealing one thing and the revelation is how empty all of our lives really are. Mass shootings, investment frauds, um, elderly people swindled in telephones, um, $20, $200 billion a year, the longest wars in our nation's history. Churches attacked. Why? Why? Why does this happen? A celebrity chef by the name of Anthony Bourdain over a year ago committed suicide at age 61 by hanging himself. He left behind a 13-year-old daughter. He, his job was to travel the world, to eat the finest foods, to sit with the most influential people. That was his job, a dream lifestyle for any of us to have. He hangs himself. Kate Spader, only a week before that, a celebrity fashion designer left behind an 11-year-old daughter. She hung herself. And then the one-liners start coming out in the news broadcast of these celebrity, iconic people who commit suicide. For Bourdain, everybody knows of his ag agnostic Epicurean lifestyle. Bourdain's one-liner was, I never saw my body as a temple, I saw it as a fun house. Well, evidently, the fun ran out. Kate Spader, uh, these very privileged, iconic people, she left behind an 11-year-old daughter. She hangs herself. She leaves a suicide note, a suicide note to her daughter, addressed to her daughter. This has nothing to do with you. Go ask your father. I wonder if anyone will be able to tell her the truth. Spent the rest of her life wondering why, why did my mother love me? What they are missing is they are missing that the truth, and the truth is how much God loves them. I feel like Cleophas on the road to Emmaus, that frightened, discouraged disciple. Are you the only one that doesn't know of everything that's going on and all that we're struggling with? Why does this happen? Why does this happen in our world? Every human being needs an answer to the question, why? Why am I alive? Why am I here? What does life mean? What does it mean to be human? Bloggers. Bloggers and, and the um, revelations of secular humanistic values are clanging bells and loud gonging symbols only adding to the emptiness of our hours. The truth is always the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And notice the triune formula that he says it in. His way, the truth, your life. Turn his way. Honor his truth. And he will give you, he will give you life. A common axiom in our culture is to dismiss that there is any truths at all. We live in a culture today, the absolute truths, if you speak of them, well, you're treated like you're an embarrassment. 
500 years ago, rationalism became integrated in philosophy and in university movements, and man moved from being a religious being to a thinking being. 300 years ago, um, the Renaissance turned into modern world, and the empirical world began, and truth had to be brewed up in a laboratory, measured and improved. And then, with the French Revolution 200 years ago, Immanuel Kant brought a skepticism to the human psyche that supernatural and divine propositions no longer hold the truth. And in the 20th century, in my lifetime, after the horrors of two world wars, the doctrine of relativism, an existential thought where every truth is just as valid as another truth, your truth and my truth. Truth is no longer absolute, but truth is something held in a privacy that I determine for myself. This is what has happened. We've lost all the definitions. We no longer have the power as men and women in the 21st century to define anything for ourselves, to find those simplest answers that keep us from the abyss. What is real? Who am I? Why am I here? The way, the truth, and the life. And that is why the youngest of Americans today in our society are the loneliest and the most suicidal ever. That is why the most privileged of people in our society today are the most depressed. And we who should be the most informed are the most polarized of all. America's today is a society fueled by corporate greed where addiction and suicide and opioids is all viewed as just well good for business. Not a single clergy person or counselor or school counselor has not sat with a young child or a teenager at some point in time who sobbingly asked them, I'm thinking about suicide, can you tell me why I'm here? What do I need to do? Winston Churchill, the great guardian of democracy in the mid-20th century, he said, truth is the most valuable thing in the world. Yet we sell it so easily and abandon it so quickly. Nathan Sharansky, a Russian-born former Israeli justice minister. When he retired, he returned to Russia to the now abandoned KGB prison where he had spent years in solitary confinement. An entourage of cameramen and newscasters are following him. What's he going to do? He comes up to the abandoned KGB prison. He says to his wife, give me a moment to go in there by myself. For it was in that dark loneliness when the only input I had was what I already had in my heart, I discovered who I was. He went into that KGB prison, now abandoned, <coughs> spent some time, came back out. The paparazzi all there with their microphones. Make a statement, make a statement. What are you going to say? He said, the only statement I'll make now is I'm going to go to see the grave of Andrei Sakharov. He went to this grave, it was a nearby cemetery. <coughs> Sakharov was the physicist who gave the USSR the atomic bomb. He lays a wreath on Sakharov's grave. Shalansky, an Israeli official, lays a wreath on his grave. He turns to the press. Now I'm ready to make my statement. And he says, the reason I wanted to honor this man is because late in his life he wrote, I was wrong. I used to think that the greatest power in all the world was the atomic bomb. But now I've realized it is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. America, Americans, we need the truth. Truth is the most powerful, valuable, important, precious of all commodities. It is so ironic that culture today is built on a proposition, a foundational proposition, that there is no longer an absolute truth. Please hear me carefully. Serious days. We've lost our definitions. We can no longer define 
what truth and a lie is, what the meaning of life, purpose of life, why I'm in here, what it means to be human, what it means to be married, what it means to be a parent, what it means to be evil, moral, or to take responsibility. Ironic that a culture cast itself out on a sea of no absolute truths, pins its new moral compass on the one institution that is universally despised and mistrusted. The political. The political correctness. It's beyond ironic. It's disastrous. It's Talk about truth for a moment. I thought that was my grandson. It's okay, it's okay. It's a great day for your family. Truth is, I want to tell you about a Malcolm Murderidge, the chronicles of wasted time. He writes, truth is very beautiful. And he writes, the human quest for justice continues. And as the instruments of human warfare pile up, truth becomes the first casualty. The lies on behalf of wars, peace treaties, revolutions, counter-revolutions, the lies of the ad man, the lies of the salesmanship, the politician, the lies of the priest in the pulpit, the professor at the podium, the journalist at the keyboard, they all stick in our throats like fish bones and choke the life out of us. The lies of paparazzi and cameramen and microphones. Muckridge goes on to write, Ex Xavius Sloan, who was a member of the Kremlin, told him, seeing a first-time delegate to the Kremlin in the days of the USSR, going to a strategic planning meeting, hearing what the proclamation was going to be, said, we can't say that. It's not true. A silence fell over the Kremlin walls. And then a roar of laughter as someone, another delegate exclaimed, when did that ever stop us from doing anything? That same laughter, Muckridge writes, is still in every boardroom and every council room around the world today. It is not God that is dead. It is truth. And we have killed it. Our culture is so sub substituted for absolute truth, propositional truth. Propositional truth is when you can design something that um, supports what you need your agenda at that moment. An illustration. These are my gloves. My wife gave them to me 10 years ago. For Christmas, these are my gloves. I wear them every day, driving to work. These are my gloves. Propositionally, though, if it suits me, I can flex my fingers and I can go, they don't fit. And a propositional truth is, if they don't fit, you must quit. <laughs> but the absolute truth is, if you committed the crime, you're guilty. That's the truth. That's the difference. <coughs> now could Muggeridge would write, in this great sea of fantasy and fraud, how can anyone hope to swim unencumbered? For where is truth? Can you find truth in a studio stage, in a movie prop? Who will dare to pull back the curtain and expose the masquerade that we might once again catch that still, small voice, the small voice of God? Can you hear it? I can hear it. Jesus says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let us never depart from it. Christianity has allowed our pocket to be picked. We either do not know or have been afraid to stand up and proclaim that simple truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. What has happened at the end of our culture? Experimentation, philosophy has become existential. Art 
once poetically to define truth and beauty, has become sexualized. Every movie, television show, education is commercial, religion is mystical, culture is trivial, and Christianity has allowed itself to become minimized in our society. It's okay, you can be a Christian, just keep it all to yourself at home, not outside. Postmodern liberal church, I say to you, and I'm not a part of this. I say to you, postmodern liberal church, you're no better than Pontius Pilate standing before Jesus going, What is truth? What is truth? Secularization is a process by which religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations lose their social acceptability. The very mention of the eternal, the divine, the supernatural can no longer be used society to speak of any topics about morality. Secularization's ultimate goal is to remove shame so that we might think we're free to do anything we want to. Not that we have been warned. We have been. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Do you know who he is? He published in 40 languages selling more than 30 million volumes in the last 50 years, he writes. The horrors and atrocities of the USSR, the Soviet Union's revolution, the Stalinist purges, the 8 and 10 and 15 million murders that happened. Why? Solzhenitsyn writes, because we as a culture have forgotten God. And he warns us in the West, never forget he is the way, the truth, and the life. Can we begin to imagine what the experience of an 18 or 19 year old going to university as a freshman today might be if they arrive at a, a university and they believe in the sanctity of marriage, the sacredness of the human body, that the Bible is real, that truth is authoritative. What is their experience? They're immediately treated as if they have some kind of a learning disability. And by social pressure and academic pressure, strained and pushed to become yet one more member of another generation of those who live with relativistic values. Ted Bundy, before he was executed, got to speak to the Reverend Dr. Um, D D Dawson, and he said, it all started with pornography. Pornography caused me to lose my sense of shame. And when I lost my sense of shame, then I could do anything. Larry Frank's trial on pornography. Art critics were brought in to discredit what he was doing. He had a very clever defense attorney. The attorney asked all these art critics, the first one, they all lined up. The first one comes up. Have you ever been to an art museum? Yes. Have you ever paid to go to an art museum? Yes. Have you ever seen a classic painting in an art museum of unrolled, disrobed people? Yes. Now can you tell this jury how paying to see it in a museum or in a magazine is different? Huh? What? 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 The first witness, the trial was over. Maybe in hindsight someone should have said, no spouse divorces another spouse because one decides to spend too much time in an art museum. Loss of shame. Shame is a good thing. Shame, the conviction of God, it keeps us from that which is bad for us. Or wrong. C.S. Lewis describes our day in his book, Pilgrim's Regret. Lewis writes about a man named John who's moving from place to place, philosophy to philosophy, trying to figure out what is true, why I'm here, who I am, what I need to do. He comes to the spirit of the ages, a great mountain, and he finds a celebration. It, it looks like a really great place. And he's there long enough to realize that for all of the greatness of the spirit of the ages, his hands are suddenly bound. And a waiter comes to bring breakfast and it loosens up the shackles. Here's your meal. And he tries to have polite conversation with the waiter. The milk is delicious. And the waiter, C.S. Lewis writes, the waiter says, how do you know that milk is delicious? 
How do you know? It's just a secretion from a cow. A cow secretes many things. Saliva, urine, feces. It, how do you know that that's delicious? It's just a, a, a secretion of a cow. And the guy doesn't know what to say. I say so he talks, well, the eggs are good too. And I don't even want to tell you what the waiter said about the eggs. And, and, and now you notice he's shackled again. And C.S. Lewis writes, but then riding up on a horse comes truth to the rescue. And truth says to the waiter in the spirit of the age, you have lied. You have lied. Because you don't know the difference between what God meant for nourishment and what God means for garbage. Secularization, when it unfolds itself, wishes to leave culture unable to identify what is good for nurture, what is good for garbage. Secularization destroys shame. Robs us of that which God uses to keep us from doing wrong. And I feel like looking at 2020, I'm clear of this. Walking away from Jerusalem. How did it come to this? How did we get here? Why is the world the way it is? Are you the only one that doesn't know what's been going on? The enemies of life, they come, they try to convince us there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no truth. I gaze upon the cross and I find my salvation. For on that cross I see that Savior, His agony for me. Oh, the love He has for me, for you. So much love. I see Him on the cross. So much love. The way, the truth, and the life. Can a man leave a little girl and hang himself because once he understands how much God loves him? Can a mother leave a child uh, with unanswered questions about why she did this to herself once she comes to understand how much God loves that child and loves that mother? When we settle for less than what God has for us, we don't know. We haven't realized how much God loves us. How much God loves us. And as we gather around this communion table, may our eyes to be open and we might see that He is once more and always the way, the truth, and the life. You may stand with me for the Apostles' Creed and communion presentation. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, as we begin this new year, I pray that as we gather at this communion table, our eyes might be opened. Our hearts might be filled and we might forever recognize that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Hear us as we pray together. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you call us to be your servant people. But we do not do as you command. We are often silent when we should speak. We are often useless when we should be helpful. We are often lazy, timid, and distracted disciples. Have mercy upon us. Free us from the sin that continually stalks us. 
In this communion moment, we would become closer to you through Jesus Christ. Amen. Have your own moment of personal silent communion preparation, prayers, and confession. And the Lord Jesus taught all the saints to always be found praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In Christ you are forgiven. In Christ we are forgiven. Stand the communion hymn as let us break bread together. <laughs> 